Hello? Test. I'm on. Uh, but since he messed that up, then <laughs> all bets are off on that. The other thing is that uh, his wife told him never to go past the preaching time again. Remember that yesterday? So he's on the hook for that, too. And uh, I, I appreciate being here. Uh, I wanted to tell you about a conference uh, that we're having. It's, um, the, it's in 2016, January 15th through 17th. I left some brochures on the table out there. If you start getting that chilly feeling in January and you want to come south on the MLK weekend, uh, you can do that. We're going to have uh, the, our, our conference there, 28th Annual Florida Regional Grace Conference, and uh, Brother Rick will be there, and he's going to be speaking three times. We're going to have uh, several other men speaking, of course. Holding fast, the faithful word is the theme. And we're looking forward to another conference. We had a great conference last year, and uh, it was fun. We had a lot of fun. We had a new guy there that was in the back, and Rich Richard was preaching, and he was preaching long, like when Eutychus fell out of the top loft. You remember that? <laughs> and uh, he's preaching long, and he started with an open-ended stop time, kind of like I've got right now, lunch, you know. So he, he's preaching and preaching and preaching, and an hour and 50-some-odd minutes into his message, he quits. And this kid in the back has, says, that was great. He says, I'm going to come back here and listen to him again tomorrow morning. And the guy next to him says, it is morning. <laughs> Poor Eutychus. It's the way it goes, isn't it? Uh, it's good to be here and uh, appreciate the, uh, the messages so far. And uh, they've been great. I've really been... Uh, Excited to uh, to see a new venue. I know that some of you are enduring the sprinklings out there underneath. Poor Leon this morning was he, his Bible was so wet he couldn't even read the pages anymore. It was dripping all over him. But uh, that's just the the nicety of having air conditioning. So we appreciate that. It's life support where we come from. We don't call it air conditioning. So turn your Bibles to Romans chapter three. Let's have a word of prayer before we get started. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the gospel of grace, and we thank you for the simplicity in that gospel message, and we thank you that uh, we have the freedom here still to preach and teach the word of God rightly divided. We thank you for it. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. The simplicity of the gospel. Romans chapter 1, Paul gives us a preview. And I, I really appreciate that preview because a preview is always something to warm you up and get you ready. And in Romans chapter 1, Brother Rick just mentioned it. He says in verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. You see, the simplicity of the gospel is the revelation of the most powerful display of love that will ever be seen or ever be heard of. It's the key to all that God wills to do. His will is that he will make his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, king and Lord and supreme ruler of heaven and earth. And all time begins with that event at Calvary. All time begins with looking forward to Calvary. All time looks back to that event at Calvary. So in God's universe of eternal thinking, there's an event. And that event inexorably changed his son. Sometimes we forget that because in 2 Timothy or 1 Timothy chapter 2, we, we read that verse where Paul says that there's one mediator between God and man, and it's the man. Christ Jesus. In Zechariah 13, they're going to look upon him whom they have pierced, and they're going to ask him that question. What are those wounds in your hands? What is those wo that wound in your side? And he's going to tell them that that's, those are the wounds that I received in the house of my friend. And then they're going to weep. Israel is going to be saved eventually. But today, in the dispensation of grace, they have to be saved 
like us, by grace through faith. Now, the idea of this is, is not new. God's grace has been active ever since he covered Adam and Eve. God's grace was not absent during the law of Moses. He tells you in Romans 5. He says to you there, he says, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. We live in the dispensation of grace, but that does not mean there's not grace in other dispensations. As a matter of fact, there, the, the God, God's grace is in every dispensation. How it's accessed is different. Back there, it's a little different. However, the problem we face today is not the social matters that we see out here in society today. Every time we hear something, it makes us matter and matter and matter. People not knowing who they are or what they are. People not understanding how to get along with each other. People not understanding who God is. People need the Lord, don't they? Man's problem is sin. That's what it is. It's death. And it's judgment. And judgment comes at death. Death itself is judgment. And it's appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. In Romans chapter 3, Paul's going to teach you in just a few verses. I, I like to say that this is really not technically correct, but Romans 3, 21 to 31, for me personally, I believe that's the gospel of the grace of God. And I believe it's laid out in a way that, that God kind of systematically brings you to that point, as Brother Rick said, those 64 verses of condemnation and guilt are brought on the whole world in Romans 1, 2, and on into chapter 3. And then there's that pivotal change in verse 21. But before he gets into that pivotal change, he's got to bring everything to a close. And I like what Brother Ted says about it. He says, you know, well, you can get saved. It's as easy as one, two, three. Just read Romans 1, 2, and 3. When you see Romans 1, 2, and 3, you realize that there's something God's been saying in chapter 1, in chapter 2, in chapter 3, and he's condemned the world system. He's condemned the self-righteous religious Jew. He's condemned the entire group of Gentiles that were given up there at the Tower of Babel. And all mankind is brought to accountability. And it culminates through a series of indictments. And, uh, you know, when you look at these indictments in Romans 1, 2, and partially there in chapter 3, you see that nothing that an individual can do can ever, ever help him escape the wrath of God. Not relative righteousness in chapter 2. Everybody else is doing it. Well, that's not going to get you off. I didn't know about it. That's not going to get you off. The idea that, oh, well, we're special. We have the law. We have God's word. We're guides of the blind. We are mm, who we are, right? And Israel thought they were something that really they weren't. And as a result, he condemns them as well. They should have known more about it than anybody. They're really accountable, I think, in a more serious way. But the problem isn't solved by just learning about sin, death, and judgment. That's the backdrop in front of which our gospel sits. And it sits out in the forefront. It, it begins, it's interesting, it begins with that first. Before he gives you the gospel, he's going to show you the backdrop. But he shows you the backdrop first. But before he shows you the backdrop, he shows you what's behind it. Okay? And turn over to Romans 1 again, and you'll see that when he mentions this, he's getting ready to launch this long diatribe of information about the condemnation and guilt of the Gentiles and the Jews and the whole world. But before he does that, he does something very gracious. And he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it, the gospel, is the power of God unto salvation. It is to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein, he says, in the gospel, not in the law of Moses,
but in the gospel. He says, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. He says, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. How are they going to live by faith? Did anybody ever keep the law of Moses? Has anybody ever kept part of the law of Moses? Well, they try, don't they? The problem is, is you can't keep 10% of it 90% of the time. Or you can't keep 90% of it 10% of the time. You have to keep all of it all of the time. And when Israel said to Moses, all that thou hast said, talking of what God gave him, he says, all that thou hast said, we will do. That's a big problem. That was a big mistake. And that was in contradistinction from what had just happened to them, where they were just literally rescued from Egypt. He says, I brought you out on eagle's wings and brought you unto myself. What's he trying to tell them there? You couldn't get out by yourself. He saved them. It's ironic to me, as you read these things, you go forward and you read about Herod, the, the great tyrant that was trying to kill all the little two-year-olds and under, and, and the Lord Jesus Christ is tucked away safely in Egypt. What's he doing? Well, he's waiting for Herod to die. And as he does that, we find out that he's taking refuge in the same place that Jacob and his family took refuge in. There's a reason behind all that. Out of Egypt, he says, I will call my son. God's solution to this problem is that Jesus Christ came to do for us what we could never do for ourselves. This culminates in the gospel of grace given to Paul. Now, we hear the gospel referred to throughout Paul's epistles. We see him preaching it in the book of Acts. We even see Peter talking about it and saying, there are some things he's saying that are hard to be understood. There's a lot of things people that Peter heard that were hard to be understood. He had trouble understanding quite a few things. And, and Paul called him on it a couple of times. By the time you get up to chapter 3, verse 18, and he goes into verse 19, he's going to make the conclusion. Chapter 3 really ends with those who are charging God with unrighteousness. And then he's going to go through this, the final verdict, and it's over. He's going to list all these things, and he, he makes those lists. And he says, in verse 19, he says, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world become guilty before God. A Jew had a message back there under the law, and the law of the schoolmaster, Paul says, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. He's not talking about us Gentiles. He's talking about the nation of Israel, about his own people. And he says, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. What was the message of the law? What was the message of the schoolmaster? You can't keep it. Stephen says, you have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. Paul says in Acts 13, he says, I want you to believe this message. And when you go over there to Acts chapter 13 and you read it, he says, it's by this man which is preached unto you that you can be justified from all things by which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. Did Israel function properly under the law? Did they come out as the poster children for those who kept the law? Was the law a failure? No. The law itself can never be a failure. It's the standard righteousness of God demonstrated in the commandments. But it is weak through the flesh, Romans 8 says. It was weak through Israel's flesh. It was weak through Abraham's flesh. It was weak, it was weak through Adam's flesh. He only had one to keep, and he couldn't keep that one. And he wasn't sinless, or he wasn't sinful when he did it. He was sinless. Herein comes the conundrum when you create a creature with a, a nature that is given the opportunity to display volition. 
But there's a reason why God gave us volition. And I believe the far end you over here in the dispensation of the fullness of times will be that he will only be in fellowship with those creatures, whether it be time past, but now or ages to come people that believed in him by faith alone. That's a very important distinction, and God is looking for us to understand that distinction. So when he says what he says in verse 19, and I believe God's only going to surround himself with people that are without sin. He, he proves that when he kicks Satan out of the third heaven. He can't have anybody there. He cannot be around anybody like that. His holiness will not allow it. And so everybody that's going to spend eternity with God will do so because they made a choice in their life using volition. Now, that choice is the single most important choice that anybody ever makes in their life. And the solution for God to the problem of man is that you make the right choice. That's what he wants you to do. But the fact that he sends people to hell on a daily basis or allows them to go there of their own volition on a daily basis proves to me he will not override the human will. That's the supreme proof right there. The fact that he created a place to put them all in one place and keep them there for eternity demonstrates to me that he will not break his own word. And he cannot be where sin is and he's not going to have it and he's already shown it and that's all there is to it. So, when you see the solution that Christ died for our sins, the only response that God's grace can accept or ever has accepted is faith. Now, Israel had faith that worked. It would work in their life. David said it himself. He says, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. But you see, when David got himself painted into a corner with Bathsheba, and he, got, he, got, he found himself guilty of something that he could not get out of by the law. Now, he was afraid of physical death. Who wouldn't be? He was afraid of scandal. He was afraid of death. He was afraid of going. But he wasn't afraid he was going because he was lost. He was afraid he was going because it was a shameful thing for him to do after all God had done for him. Who wants to die in front of your family? Who wants to die in front of your nation? Who wants to die as the man being the apple of God's eye couldn't keep his eyes off the woman next door? It's a shameful thing. Shameful when he did it. and Shameful when he covered it up. It was shameful when he... And, th and there you see that blasphemy among the Gentiles being fulfilled right there. The issue with God is to demonstrate to you that you need a Savior. That took place for 1,500 years on the law of Moses with Israel. And Israel is not saved, and as a nation, they will be saved. And they will be saved when they have the opportunity, like Zechariah 13 shows, that they by faith will also believe God's word. But they have never done that yet. Now, we have a new system, which is through faith, that allows us to now exercise our faith, as Brother Leroy said, in the work of Jesus Christ. The faith of Christ needs to be understood. And this system through faith is how we access God today. We're doing it today in the dispensation of grace. With Israel, it shall be done with them in the future. And so all Israel shall be saved as a nation. But that did not exclude those individuals in the back, back here, who lived under a law system. They could be justified under that law system, but not by the law. They could be justified by faith while they lived under that law because they were operating under a covenant that was already in place, and that's called the Abrahamic covenant, and that's not based on the law. And it didn't nullify itself just because God put the law on them. The law was a temporary problem. Uh, the law was a temporary solution to a problem that, that was there, and he needed to do that. He needed to prove that Israel couldn't keep the law. And if the most selfish, self-righteous people that ever lived, who were the most religious people that ever lived, 
If they couldn't keep the law, who's going to? He had, they had the law. The Gentiles said, who's got laws like this? Who's got this? Who's so close to God as these people? And look what they did. They blasphemed God among the Gentiles. They're just like Jonah. They didn't want to go to the Gentiles. They just ran. Someday they'll go, just like Jonah did. But while they sought to be justified, and they had to be justified before they died, that justification came to them as soon as they understood the need for a redeemer. And the law brought that to them. That's the lesson of the law. That's the message of the schoolmaster. They needed to understand that redemption is through blood. And it is through, not through the blood of bulls and goats, which cannot take away sin. It is through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. However, they had to believe that by faith because that was still in the future. You cannot declare something to be until it actually has happened. You see, there's a reason why God does not reveal all this until after Calvary. Before Calvary, Jesus Christ is headed towards the cross. He's a dead man walking. And, and you cannot have a dead king ruling over an eternal kingdom. He has to be resurrected. And we now know, if you go back to Romans chapter 1, that Paul declares that God has demonstrated his son to be exactly who he promised him to be. Look at Romans chapter 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, verse 1, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. Notice the parenthesis, which he had promised afore in, by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Doesn't 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4 say the same thing? The Christ died for our sins part is current. But the part about the scriptures is according to this message. You see, Paul begins with a basic foundational understanding of this promise, and it's called the gospel of God in the first verse. Now, he calls it other things as he moves through the chapter here and on into chapter 2 and so forth, and he calls it the gospel of Christ, and he calls it my gospel, and he calls it the, the gospel of your salvation, and he begins to call it all kinds of things because it's multifaceted, but... You have to understand it's progressive too. This is not the gospel of the kingdom. Paul never preached the gospel of the kingdom because he wasn't qualified to do so. However, he does understand the issue in the gospel of the kingdom because he himself teaches what the core issue in the gospel of the kingdom is also in Acts 19. He says that they were to believe on him who was to come, that is, on Christ Jesus. So when those folks came down to meet John the Baptist, the guys that were coming with the works, he told them to hit the bricks. You know, this whole thing is really not that complicated because he, he declares his son to be, and if you notice verse 3 in chapter 1, verse 2, if you go down to verse 3, he, in the context, he, he tells you what he's saying here. He says, concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. There is the prophetic aspect. Now, look at verse 4. And declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead, by whom we have received grace and apostleship. He was the first one to receive that grace, wasn't he? that in me first he might show forth. And you see that as God shown forth his grace on, the, on the, what we would consider public enemy number one with Saul of Tarsus, he not only bestows his grace on him and saves him by his grace, but he makes him the apostle to the Gentiles for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. You see, God has a plan, and that plan includes you and I. Satan was never worried about us little fleshly made worms down here on planet Earth who are earthbound, <laughs> earthlings, good name for us, okay? He was never worried about us coming up into the heavenly places and taking over his domain. He sees Israel's program with earthbound earthlings, and he sees us as no different. Now you understand why he was completely taken up and taken by the idea of this whole concept of the mystery? he realized that we're going to be changed. 
And that change that we have in our new bodies will allow us to eliminate the Apollo system and the shuttle system and all the other systems. <laughs> These poor, pathetic sods out there trying to get out there and find little specks of rocks out in floating around to live on and they don't realize this is not how you do this. This is a pathetic attempt for the creature to act like the creator. It's sad, isn't it? I was talking about Dr. Ben Carson earlier and I said uh, this idea of uh, What he was talking about at the university, he had a whole group of people there, and the, these young kids were asking him questions, and he was having a Q&A, and, &A, and this kid kind of gave him some trouble about, you know, this, this idea of him trusting God as the creator and believing in God and his whole general idea of him being a Bible-believing Christian. I haven't heard his testimony yet, but I would like to, but he is saying some things about it that are getting people upset. These kids were just listen to what he had to say, and this boy asked him this question, and he says, why do you consider this idea of a creator so important? Why do you, you know, think this way? And he started giving him a hard time, and he says, you know, you give me a hard time for believing that God created me, and I believe in God. Well, the main thing is not to believe in God, it's to believe God, believe what he says in his word. He says, he says, you believe in evolution. You believe you came from a monkey. He says, I give up. You've convinced me. <laughs> That's the way it is. If you want to be a monkey man, fine. That's okay with me. But I can tell you that the people who believe in evolution and the people that believe in all of these other cults and heresies when they go to talk about the law today and, and they want to talk about their stuff being stolen and their family being killed and the things that are going on in the law of Moses, they agree with all of those things and all, so does all Western civilization and most of the rest of the world. They all agree with the law until they get to the fourth commandment and he says that the Lord made the earth in six days. They chuck that one right out. They take all the moral issues they want out of it and leave you hanging there with the Sabbath verse like, we don't know what that means. It means that God created the earth in six days. That's what it means. You see, the creator of heaven and earth, he doesn't laugh about these things. And when he brings this thing up, he, he makes it very clear by the time you get to Romans 3.19 that there isn't a chance anywhere that you're going to escape my wrath. Every single individual from the beginning of time with Adam and Eve back there to the end of the millennial kingdom when it's all over into the dispensation of the fullness of times, all men that spend eternity with God and women, all people, will do so because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ and no other way. That's it. It still is the blood. It is nothing but the blood. And he says in verse 19 of chapter 3, he says, Now we know that what things soever the law, uh, whoso, excuse me, now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped. And that all the world may become guilty before God. You see how inclusive this is? Then he says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. No flesh is all inclusive. Then he says, For by the law is the knowledge of sin. So with Adam and Eve, you had the entrance of sin. With Moses and the law, you've got the knowledge of sin. And with the Lord Jesus Christ, you've got the supreme payment for sin. That's what he's getting ready to tell you. You see, Abraham, if you go over to verse 4, or chapter 4, verse 1, he says, this is a beautiful passage to open up chapter 4, because Paul's going to talk to you about how people were justified in time past. But he says, what shall we say then that Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God, not in God's sight. See, there are multiple types of justifications in your Bible, and when you demonstrate righteousness as a person, 
that is a form of justification. God himself participates in justification. He is also justified. When he demonstrates something to be true and he brings all the books out and shows everybody, he's vindicated. You see? <laughs> when you demonstrate Christ living in you, you're vindicated also. We, we talked about that last night. Richard, beautiful message on that about Jesus Christ living through you. That's a vindication that Christ in you, the hope of glory, is true. It's there. Now, wouldn't you like to be that way 98% of the time? You will be. You'll be 100% that way in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. It'll all be over. I won't have time to call you. You're already going to know. And I can tell you that I fully expect never to preach here again. I'm going to live that way for the next 365 days. I've been doing that every year I've been here, okay? And I'm still waiting, hoping, okay? Because I have a hope that I can confidently expect to happen. And I can, I can tell you that somebody's going to be here when he comes. It might as well be us as anybody else. Right? Amen. So now you see that there is a type of justification here that is demonstrable to people. And it's very important that we demonstrate righteousness. Yes, but not before God. That issue is not settled by how we do or what we do. That is always settled and always will be settled by the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did. So that's where we step out of the ring. We can't deal with that. If that was the case, then we don't need a Savior. If there's ever a way to get saved without it, then we don't need a Savior. Why not just keep, keep the law? Yes, you can. Can't do it. It doesn't satisfy God. But it did satisfy him to do it to prove that nobody could do it. Brother Rick says, I, I like the way he says it, that he made a difference back there in time past to prove there is no difference. And that's exactly right. Verse 21 says, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. Here it is. We've got it. We can see it. The law is no longer an issue. It's been nailed to the cross of Calvary. And the witnesses to its ineffectiveness are the law itself and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Now, as we work down through 25, 26, 27, and 28, there's a lot of meat here to go through in just a short period of time. But I want, to try to get, I want to try to get a couple of points across that I really feel are important in this area. The issue that God had to be satisfied. Look at verse 25. Whom God has set forth. The propitiation for our sins was the man of God's own choosing, as Luther said. It's God that does it. And it's the Lord Jesus Christ who agrees to do it. It's the Lord Jesus Christ who comes to do it. It's the Lord Jesus Christ as a man who doubted if he could do it. He was so diswrought in the Garden of Gethsemane that he sweat, not bullets, but blood. He said, let this cup pass from me. That verse bothered me for years. Why would he say that? He was a man. That's why he said it. And he was a sinless man that said it. Would that not be a, a, a simple request? For him it was because he knew who he was asking. The other thing about it is that he understood who God was in a way that we don't. And to endure his wrath for the sins of 25 billion people or more, I don't know how many we've had so far, that's what they say. But to endure the wrath of his own father could not be taken lightly. And it seems to me that sweating blood in the Garden of Gethsemane was, was something that, well, he came through it fine, didn't he? He was already beginning to bear it. He was bearing it when he stood before Pilate and, and before uh, Herod, but when he kept silent. Oh, yeah. He was bearing it when he took the stripes. He was bearing it when they put the crown on him. He was bearing it the whole time, and he was comforted before at the transfiguration about how to deal with that. 
This was all worked out in the past. Oh, this was beautiful. And he lived, as Brother Rick brought out last night, beautifully. It was just, you know, just living in the perfect will of his father. Let this cup pass from me. And then immediately he says, nevertheless, thy will be done. That's the mind renewal at its highest level. I don't think it's a problem for Jesus Christ to be faithful unto death. People have been saying, I've been hearing rumors about this, people talking about this issue, the buzz on it is that Jesus Christ didn't have to have faith. Well, let me tell you, that verse says he did. Okay, Galatians chapter 3, turn over there quickly. And uh, Galatians chapter 3. In verse 22, he says, But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by what? Faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. Turn over to Philippians. In chapter 2, in verse 8, he says, And being found in fashion as a man, he was born of a woman. He was born under the law. He humbled himself. He became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He did exactly what he came to do. He did it perfectly. He did it so perfectly that the proof of God's acceptance is the fact that he now sits at his own father's right hand, making intercession for you and I. He sits there as the king of glory, as Paul calls him, the O king eternal. I don't have a problem with him being the king eternal, do you? People say, he's not our king, and we're not cheap. He's king eternal. That's what a head is. We don't call him that because we're trying to avoid some confusion about the kingdom program. That's okay. But let me tell you something. He is the king. And he is never going to be anything less than that. But he's also our savior. And he's our redeemer. He's going to be Israel's revenger. He doesn't come in our time for revenge. He comes without revenge. He doesn't come to bring the wrath of God. He comes to what? Talk about it being delayed. The wrath is held back. It's revealed. And he goes into a very long dissert dissertation here in 64 verses to show you exactly why you're not going to get out of it. But the fact is, it's not coming on us today. God is not punishing Gentiles today. He's not punishing Jews. He's not punishing lost people. He's not punishing saved people. He's saving people today and putting them into the body of Christ by grace through faith. Amen. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. I love that. That's Titus chapter 2, verse 11. The grace that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. All men won't believe it and all men don't. But that doesn't mean it hasn't appeared. It's here. God's grace brings the message. It's the motive under which he operates. He does it because he loves us. Turn over to Romans 5, and you can see this. As you go down through the attributes of being justified in verse 1, 2, 3, and 4, then you get into 5. He says, and, I hope, and hope maketh not ashamed. I'm not ashamed of Christ, and you should not be either. The hope we have is the only hope. And he says, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us, and when we were yet, for when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. That's the only time you're going to see the Holy Spirit in the book of Romans until you get to chapter 8. It's a great verse, and it stands alone as it should. But when you get over there in chapter 8, you've been scratching your head through chapter 7 trying to figure out how understanding justification by faith can help me stop sin in my life, and that's not enough. You need the Holy Spirit. And so imputation is one thing, impartation is another. And the Holy Spirit is imparted in our lives, and in Romans chapter 8, in the first several verses, 19 times he begins to show you the Holy Spirit in a way that you need to understand so that you can live and walk and display and show what is the perfect will of God, that acceptable will of God.
You can't do it without the Holy Spirit. That's why Satan likes to take the doctrine of the Holy Spirit and turn it into something charismatic so that you think it's something else. I don't think, you know, 40 or 50 men and women laying around on the floor rolling around with some guy walking over them is something that we should look at to figure out how we're going to be godly. I mean, just, you know, take it for what it's worth, but I see that guy walking all over those guys and he's going around over here, you know. I came home one night, and my kids were watching Ernest Angley, and they were all laughing. I thought the Comedy Channel was on, and I didn't know they were, shouldn't be watching that stuff. And they said, no, we're watching this guy right here, and they're laughing. They thought it was funny. <laughs> you know, it is kind of funny when you look at it like that, but when you realize who's got them in their clutches, it's not so funny. It is sad. And, you know, it's, it's a great thing to understand that Paul is now demonstrating that God's grace is, is, is completely and totally enough. He says in verse 25, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation. He must be propitiated. There's no way that he cannot be propitiated. It's already happened. That propitiation must be legal. It must be fully satisfying it must be there and it must be done exactly the way he wanted it done look at Romans chapter 8 and look at verse 32 you know before the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins he died on the cross for his father now he did not do it to take care of his father's sins because his father didn't have any sin he did it because he did it in obedience to the father he did it because they planned it, and he kept his word, see? And that's why I believe in obedience there in Philippians 2, we show, it shows his faithfulness to do that. Now, that's, that's critical. Notice in Romans 8, verse 32, you see this beautifully said. I, I love this verse. He says, he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Not how is he going to do it. How is he not going to do it after this has been done? The Lord Jesus Christ did what he was supposed to do, and for him to not give us this and not give us to him, is, it's criminal. It's like trying to get half your sins forgiven. It's like being a little bit pregnant. It's just not possible. We've got about four or five ladies in our group all having babies at, the one, at one time, and they're all girls. We're going to have to get them up here to get some equity in this room back there. You know, the, the idea is that that he did it for his father. Look at this. It's beautiful. When, when you when you see it, it's just incredible. That he he delivered him up for us all, didn't he? He spared not his own son. He delivered us up. He delivered him up for us all. And you say, wow, that's great. Now turn over to Ephesians chapter five. He put him forth, didn't he? Yeah, he's the man of God's own choosing. He's the sacrifice. When Isaac asks, he says, we got everything here to do this. Now, where's the lamb? He says, God will provide himself a lamb. He'll be the lamb. In Ephesians chapter 5, in verse 2, he says, And walk in love, Paul says, as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering, and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. He gave himself for us, just like Romans 8, or just like Romans 5. If you look over, uh, you know, when you, when you start examining these verses, uh, you see these other verses. Look over 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and Paul says this beautifully too. He says, Christ our Passover. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. In verse 7, purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. 1 Corinthians 5, 7 tells you right there. He's the true, the, the true sacrifice, the true Passover lamb. He is the one that came to do what nobody else could ever do. It is through faith in his blood. Oh, we got a beeper going off here. Does that mean anything? <laughs> Evidently not. It quit. Okay. 
First, first, I'm sorry. I'm just joking. The idea of this declaration, turn back to Romans 3, and we'll try to close this right up. Romans chapter 3. It can't be any other way. And grace through faith is the way that it's been designed to happen. He's going to demonstrate his righteousness. Look at verse 25. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past. Are those your past sins? God never forgives partial sins. It's unjust for God to declare you righteous before him and then sometime in the next 15 minutes, you blow it. It doesn't work. When he takes care of your sins, he takes care of all of your sins, according to Colossians chapter 2, Galatians chapter 1. When he says Christ died for our sins, he, he would have said some of them if he meant it. Don't you think? These forbearance, this forbearance here is because back here under this program from Adam all the way up until the Lord Jesus Christ, the period Paul calls time past, God had to forbear them. There wasn't any other way to deal with them. You don't forbear people that are perfect. You forbear people that need forbearing, don't you? Yes. So now he explains for the first time in the Bible, and he's the only man to ever do this, how those people back there were covered by the future shed blood of Jesus Christ and the full faith and credit of Calvary. And they didn't get that by the law. If righteousness could have come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. They sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. You see, when he's talking to them about these issues, he's trying to straighten this out because if you'll notice that the type of thinking that promotes that has carried on into the dispensation of grace, where did it come from? Back there. Israel set a bad example, and everybody's been seeing it. He says to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just. It's the only way he can do it. And the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. He has to do it in a just manner. And because he does that, he's qualified to be your justifier. God the Father worked this all out. God the Son carried it all out. And the Holy Spirit is now putting us all into the body of Christ the minute we trust it. It takes away boasting in verse 27. Where is that? Where is boasting then? It is excluded. Yeah, but how is it excluded? He says, by, the, by what law? What is the principle? What's the guiding principle that would get rid of boasting? Would keeping the law get rid of that? That's not what Paul says about that. Look at Romans 2. He says, Behold, thou art called a Jew, and resteth in the law, and makest thy boast of God. Is it a good thing to boast? Well, look at Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, what does he say? Verse 30, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters. You think boasters are good? Would you like to be in heaven with one boaster? He'd be the loneliest guy up there because nobody wants to fellowship with him. Yeah. He says, where is boasting then? What principle gets rid of that? By what law does that get excluded? Is it the law of works? He says, nay, absolutely not. He says, but by the law of faith. It's like the law of sin and death. Wherever sin is, death follows. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. So in order for you to understand why that law is your death knell, you need to believe what it says. And if you believe the law, and its ability to condemn you and prove you not only to be guilty before God, but to be a sinner and have a list of sins that he's got to deal with, 
believe me, you find yourself guilty before God. I thank God that Jesus Christ saved me when I was just a young boy. And I've never doubted that I'm saved since then. I've learned a lot of things. I've had to undo a lot of things. I use white out in my Bible because I write things down that aren't true. And I learn later they're different. It's right. It's just not, it's not right. <laughs> and I go, oh, I've got to change that. But changing my words in the notes and in the margins is not the same thing as changing the words in the text. We change the words in the songs, but we don't touch the text. And those things are called progress for us, edification, growth. We learn these things. No, he says, works won't get rid of the problem of boasting. He says, the law of faith will. Here's the conclusion. As Solomon said, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. So how's that working for you? <laughs> didn't work for Solomon. It didn't work for David either. It didn't work for anybody. It won't work for you. He says, therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. That's the gospel of the grace of God. That's the gospel of Christ. That's the gospel of your salvation. It is grace through faith in the provision that God's grace provided to fix it so that you would have something to believe and your faith, your volition, makes that decision for you. It's an eternal decision and it can never be undone. It's so simple. At camp this year, I met a little boy and him and his sister were there for the first time and he was asking wanted to ask me some questions after my teaching session and uh, we had a chance to talk to him and give him the gospel and uh, so I was talking to him in the gym and I, I said you know we were talking about the Lord and him getting saved I'm trying to follow up with him a little bit and uh, I asked him the questions that I always ask and I keep asking him the questions all through camp because we talk to him all through the camp. We don't just talk to them one time. We try to talk to them as much as we can and confirm it. Because when they leave, they're going back home, back in the world. We won't see them for a year again. And sometimes we never see them. This little boy was the easiest, the easiest conversion I've ever had probably in my entire life at camp. He, he brought no resistance. He was, he was truly hell scared. But, but that week, he got saved. And so when I, I found his sister, and I went and talked to her about it, and she started crying. I said, well, you should be crying. I hope those are joy, tears of joy because your, your little brother's saved. He's in the body of Christ with you. She gave me a good testimony. So he comes to, to camp lost, and then he goes home saved. That's the mission. That's the stronghold that was pulled down around that kid because, not because I gave him something to do, but because I said, there isn't anything you can do. Just believe that Christ died for your sins. So I gave him one of my little cards, which I have on the back, Christ died for our sins. And at the end of the week, I said, uh, you still got my card? He pulled it out. He goes, yeah, I got it right here. One verse, all he needed, 1 Corinthians 15, 3. He believed it. I believed it. And I hope he has the benefit of looking back on it 52 years after it happened, like I have. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you, Lord, that the message today is so simple a little child can have it. They can understand it. They can believe it by faith and be put into the body of Christ with everyone else that it's by grace through faith, and we thank you for it today. It's such a blessed message, and Lord, we thank you for it. We thank you for the opportunity to come and to preach and to teach and to fellowship here this week, and we thank you for your son, most of all, who did this for us. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Okay, I think I dropped that little...